Oops, I didn't hit record. I must not have. Um, so if we go back to the very foundation of this country, right, if I had everybody in this room just for the sake of argument, everybody stand up, okay, depending on the direction in which we go, right, you would find that by the time we get to the original requirements, we continue to weed people out, right? So at the collegiate level, the way this works, everybody stands up. If you were under the age of 21, you sit down, right? Now, obviously, that includes all of you. Nobody in this room is 21 yet except for me. Okay, but that was the last change, right? The 26th Amendment is what changes the voting age in the United States from 21 to 18. And okay. are you allowed to vote at 16? Theoretically, you actually could, right? This is the fascinating thing about the 26th Amendment. It only says that you cannot be denied the right to vote once you turn 18. Right? Meaning a state cannot prohibit you from voting once you're 18 years of age. Could a state determine for themselves that they want to let 16-year-olds vote? The answer would actually be yes. Right? Now, I don't see a state doing that. I don't think that's ever going to happen. Right? Because in reality, when we changed, when we lowered the voting age to 18, ultimately all we really did was just increase the number of eligible voters who choose not to vote. All right? Um, let's see. Continuing to go backwards, you'd end up with uh, gender. Well, you'd end up with income, really, because you get lim uh, you eliminate poll taxes uh, with the 24th Amendment, right? You go back and you get rid of any sort of literacy test, so there's no sort of uh, intellectual requirement in order to vote. Although maybe on some level that'd actually be a good idea. Right? I, I mean, it would be arbitrary, which is why you could never enact it, and I'm not advocating it. Right? Sadly, stupid people are going to be allowed to vote. Right? They get their, they're allowed to get a driver's license, so what's the difference? Okay? Uh, continue going back, 19th Amendment, right? All the ladies in the room would have to sit down and okay? go back further, 15th Amendment, right? All the minority men would end up sitting down until so you get all the way back to sort of the foundation of the United States in which you essentially have white male property owners as being the only ones that can vote, all right? And again, property ownership is not a difficult thing to obtain at this point in time, right? I mean, initially, right? Property is not necessarily easy to own today, but in 1789, it's not difficult to acquire property if you wanted to, okay? There are requirements uh, these are set by state legislatures in order to be able to vote, right? You have to be a citizen of the United States. That is true all across the board. Okay? You have to establish residency. Right? This, in reality, if there is voter fraud, right, this is probably the only thing that we actually see or the closest thing that we see in terms of voter fraud, right? And when I say fraud, what I mean is, like, I know of a teacher in this school, Right, who technically committed voter fraud on election day. Right? Because that individual drove like two counties over where they used to live and went and voted there. Because that's where they were still registered. They had not updated their registration after having purchased a home. Right? Is that fraud? Yeah, technically, I guess. Are you trying to figure out who it is? Yeah. You won't figure out who it is. You said it was a person. You probably still wouldn't be able to guess. Well, I guess you probably could guess if I told you it was in the hallway. So, who knows? Maybe you could be right. Doesn't matter. The truth of the matter is, one, if you're going to claim that that's voter fraud, that's, that's a bit of a stretch to begin with. Right? Did that individual go and vote for... Um, local offices that, that don't necessarily represent them and, and therefore maybe they didn't have a right to vote for those? Probably, right? But obviously whoever this individual voted for for president of the United States, that's not a fraudulent vote by any stretch of the imagination, right? Next, age. Again, I mentioned this a second ago. Theoretically, a state legislature could lower the age below 18, but they cannot raise it above 18, okay? And then finally, in most states, you have to register. And the registration is probably the 
biggest variance between uh, states, right? There are some states, okay, North Dakota, you don't have to register at all. There are a number of states where you can actually walk up on election day and register and vote at the exact same time, all right? There are other states where you need to be registered 30 days in advance, okay? Some states you need to be registered 60 days in advance. The state of New York, you have to register like six months in advance. Okay? Donald Trump's own children could not vote for him in the primary because they had not registered as Republicans with enough time because their whole family is all a bunch of Democrats. They are. You can do with that information whatever you wish. All right? But this is something that states determine for themselves. Yes, sir? What are the registration laws for Texas? No. Uh, I do not. I think you have to be registered 30 days out. You are allowed to register in the state of Texas at 17 years, 10 months. Um, literally, I had a student, and I'll, I'll use his name because I don't think he would care, right? Eli, whose 18th birthday was November 8th, right? So, is he eligible to vote? Yes. Literally, on his birthday, he could go and cast a vote for President of the United States. But, in order to do that, he had to be registered. So, I gave him a registration card in, like, September. He's allowed to fill it out at that point, sign it, do everything, even though he is not 18 years of age at that point and not legally allowed to vote. Because that's the only way that he would have been registered by law in order to vote on the 8th. Right? Um, we had that whole conversation here where I gave you your voter registration card, right? We remember that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it's 17 years and 10 months because that's the, that's the law here in Texas. All right. But you have to be registered uh, 60 days out. Texas has an open primary system. Some states do, some states don't. Um, but that's something that we'll get to a little bit more down the road as well. All right. Voter turnout now, the actual voter turnout, and I will be 100% honest with you, I told the first semester kids okay, that I would not have been surprised if this presidential election cycle saw a record turnout in terms of voter participation. Okay? And when I say record, I mean sort of like modern record, because if you go back 150 years ago, like 85% of eligible Americans actually voted. Okay. Today, in a presidential election, and this number is actually a little out of date, uh, Obama increased this relatively significantly, actually. Right? Obama's two terms or two election cycles, we got up to almost 60% uh, participation. Right? And so I told the first semester kids it would not surprise me if you saw you know, 65% because it was such a sort of polarizing election. By the same token, it would not have surprised me in the slightest if you had seen a massive drop in voter turnout down to like 50% because you had probably the worst two candidates in the history of candidates. All right? Um, anybody know what voter turnout was? 55? A little bit higher. I saw 57. Right? I saw 57. It might have been 56 point something, and it was rounded up. And, you, and again, some of those numbers vary because of uh, absentee ballots and things like that. Um, apparently, there, there were, I mean, look, if you, again, if you guys followed the election cycle, you know that, what was it, Michigan, they didn't call Michigan for Trump until, like, mid-December. Right? I mean, it took a long, maybe early December, it took a long time um, because they had to count so many different votes and absentees and things like that. All right? Um, our midterm, what we call midterm elections, and that's what you'll see in 2018. Right? So in 2018, in Texas, it's actually fairly uh, important. We'll have uh, a senator on the ballot in 2018. We did not have a senator on the ballot here this year. Okay? Uh, I want to say... I want to say it's Ted Cruz that would be up for re-election in 2018. Uh, 
So was we would have a Senate ballot, uh, and then the House of Representatives, because they're on two-year terms, right, every, every midterm election and every presidential election, they're up for re-election as well, all right? Um, so ultimately what happens there is you get even fewer people in midterm elections because most Americans, and, and I would tell you over and over and over again, wrongfully so, believe that it, everything begins and ends with the President of the United States. Okay? If you actually read the Constitution of the United States of America, the most important aspect of our government is Congress. In which case, midterm elections should be just as high in terms of voter turnout. They should be. Especially when you consider that 90% of Americans think Congress does a terrible job. And yet congressmen get reelected 85% of the time. There's a disconnect there that should alarm you. All right? Um, there are other Western nations or industrialized nations, first world nations, whatever term you want to use, uh, that have uh, voter turnout as high as 90%. That is somewhat Ill, uh, misleading because there are some nations that uh, conduct their ballot systems very differently. And um, some of them actually have penalties for not voting. Okay? Um, some of them... I mean, there, there are some countries in which elections are, are far more fraudulent than what you see uh, at the United States level. And there are also variations on how one votes or what they vote for. Uh, the good example here is always the English system. Okay? So if you become an English citizen someday, and I don't know if Canada might do this as well, because Canada is a parliamentary government but I know that England does. You do not cast a ballot in England for an individual, ever. You vote for a party, okay? And there are actually like 10 parties. And so whatever percentage of the vote that party gets, they get that many seats in parliament, right? <clears throat> Whichever party has the most seats in parliament, they get to have the prime minister at that point in time. So they get the highest seat in the land. And then the way that it works is the party just has a list of names, right? Here are all the people that we're going to fill jobs with. And if they get 10 seats, they count down 10 names on the list, they draw a line, those top 10 get a job. Number 11 is just out of luck. Oh well. Alright? Um, that <clears throat> can tend to lead to uh, far more political participation because people feel like they have more options. Okay, and they have more options affords them an opportunity to feel like they're actually voting for somebody that is more representative of themselves, right? I am certain there are a number of people that voted in this past election cycle, either for Clinton or for Trump, who felt like neither one of them represented them very well, that neither one of them was ultimately a good candidate, and they were simply voting against the other person, right? Sadly, we end up with that situation in America all too often where we vote against the lesser of two evils, or that's sort of the way that we see that occurring, all right? <clears throat> as far as our barriers to voter turnout go, obviously the fact that you have to register um, becomes problematic. Like I said, in New York State, you have to register something like six months out, all right? There have been instances or manners in which we have tried to... Uh, ease this sort of process. One of them is the Motor Voter Act, right? The Motor Voter Bill in 92. When you go to get or update your driver's license now, you will be afforded uh, an opportunity to register or to update your registration if you changed, uh, if you changed addresses, right? Um, makes it pretty easy on the downside, and I don't, for the life of me, I don't understand why they haven't done this. You cannot register online. Right? When I moved to Texas, that was the first thing I tried to do. Right? Or one of the first things that I tried to do was update my voter registration. And so I went online and tried to register in the state of Texas. And they were like, hey, that's great, but you got to print this little paper out and sign it and mail it in. Well, I don't own a printer. Because owns a printer these days, right? Yeah, some of you probably 
usually do. I don't, because if I really need to print something out, what am I going to do? Just don't bring it here and print it here. Right? Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so in fact, I actually, I actually went to the government teacher before me and got one of those cards, and that's how I registered when I got here. All right. Um, the manner in which we vote uh, sometimes precludes or, or uh, discourages people from voting. Uh, how many of you voted in the last election in this room? Nobody? I thought somebody who was 18 in here and actually voted, no? Okay. Um, when you do go to vote, what you will learn and what you will realize is that our ballots are actually fairly long um, and tedious. And the truth of the matter is, is you're going to get down to the bottom of it. And even somebody like me who pays attention a great deal to politics and political events and things like that, I get down to the bottom of the ballot and I'm sitting there looking at like local judge. I, I don't know. Man. Mm -hmm. I, I, I got nothing. Right? I mean, at that, part, at that point, I might just look at their party and, and make a decision based off of that. Which is not the greatest way to vote, but local judge, right? In all honesty, I hope I never see a local judge. All right. Um, our general election turnout is far greater than our primary election turnout. That's not even close. Right? In fact, most people don't vote in primaries. Okay? In, in fact, there are uh, there's sort of sneaky ways uh, to get things done through a ballot box by having them done at a primary turnout rather than a general election turnout because you would get a much lower turnout. If I remember correctly, when the state of California tried to pass a constitutional amendment outlawing gay marriage in the state of California, yes, California tried to outlaw gay marriage. Okay, It passed there. The state of California, about 15 years ago, okay, passed a state constitutional amendment because every state has its own constitution. Defining marriage is a union between one man and one woman. And the reason that they were able to get that through in part is because they put it into an election where a lot of people wouldn't turn out. And so if they mobilize the people that are that, that they're trying to get to support this and saying, hey, it's really important that you go and vote for this one thing, right, then they're able to get it passed with Maybe 15% of the actual population voting for it because you only had 25% of the population even show up to vote in a primary election. All right? Okay. Uh, we talked about this a little bit, the difficulty in obtaining absentee ballots with like our little activity there with Ben Boatman, right? Okay. Absentee balloting is not an easy way to vote. When I was in the Marine Corps, it was difficult. Right? It was a sort of tedious process in order for me to ask for a ballot, have it mailed to me, fill it out, mail it back, right, all that. Okay. The political reasons, right, we've talked about efficacy before, so a lot of people are just apathetic, they don't care. Okay. We have dissatisfaction, that shouldn't be difficult for you to understand, like I said, in the last election cycle because of this dissatisfaction ideology or understanding, it would not have surprised me in the slightest if voter turnout had dropped back down to like 50% because people just didn't like the candidates or the parties, right? I mean, at this point in time, the Republican and Democratic parties are widely viewed as being out of touch, both of them, in many regards, as being out of touch with what the people want, all right? Um, and then again, the fact that we only end up with a two-party system. And we'll go over that in more detail because you will see how a two-party system is an inevitability in the manner in which we conduct our elections. Okay? I hate to tell you this. I really do because I don't believe it. But on some level, it's accurate. Okay? Voting for a third-party candidate is a wasted vote. They have no chance of winning. Okay? In fact, Gary Johnson, if ever the Libertarian or Green Party was to get 5% of the popular vote vote, and you'll learn in a couple of days or possibly in the next unit why 5% of the popular vote matters, 
Okay, but if ever they were to have gotten 5% of the popular vote, this would have been the election cycle for it to happen. Right? Jill Stein got what? 1%. And Gary Johnson got what? Close to 3. Right? That's it. Right? And nowhere remotely close to the actual 5% that the Libertarian Party needed in order to be a real party. All right. <clears throat> so we talked about all of this before when we got before we did that little uh, activity out in the hall, right? So people that are more likely to vote, <clears throat> the higher your income, the higher your age, right? Whites are more likely to vote. Okay? Actually, whites are more likely to vote than blacks. Blacks are more likely to vote than Hispanics. Okay? The Democratic Party is doing their best to try to mobilize Hispanic and black voters. All right. Um, ultimately, the Democrats believe, truthfully, that they don't have to do anything. They don't have to change. Because as this country becomes more minority-majority, eventually they're just going to win every election just because blacks and Hispanics vote for Democrats. Right? They, they ultimately really do believe that. Okay, so now the question is, does voter turnout actually matter to us? Is it important in the United States? Okay, if you think about it, it really is. Okay, you want to have a voice. And I will tell you, this is one thing that I tell every class that I ever teach. Okay, if you don't vote when you are old enough and eligible to vote, don't complain. Don't. Because you voluntarily chose to keep your mouth shut on election day, you need to keep your mouth shut for the next four years. Okay? Because if you're not willing to exercise that right at that point in time, I don't care what you have to say. Your opinion is irrelevant to me. Okay? Now, if you went out and voted for Trump in this election cycle, and a year from now you're like, damn, that was a mistake. Complain all you want. I got no problem with that. It's okay. You drank the Kool-Aid. You ain't the only one. All right? It doesn't matter if the person you voted for is ultimately not the candidate for the president or the congressman that you thought they would be. Right? You still exercise your right to vote. And having done so, you have a right to complain when things are not going in a manner in which you wish them to go. All right? Now, in terms of our voter turnout also, when we look at the statistics of our voter turnout, and one of the things we love to talk about is we love to talk about like demographics across Congress, right? Because how would we define Congress? Right? If we were just to stereotypically describe a random Congress person, right, what are they? Old, what? Old white, white man. man. Right? Who is also the most likely American to vote? Old white man. So can you be angry if old white men elect other old white men? <laughs> All right, maybe you can be angry if you're one of those non-old white men who actually is participating in the system. Right? But when the majority of our participants are wealthier, older white men, then it's no, it should not come as a shock to anybody that our representatives are wealthier, older white men. And we're going to talk about the path to the presidency today, uh, and we'll stop before we get to the Electoral College, and we'll come back to the Electoral College on Thursday as we begin in this class to actually debate whether or not the Electoral College is a good idea. Right? So again, Thursday and Friday, a little less me talking, a little more you doing stuff. What? No, I just hit my hand. Okay. All right. Um, so, understand that the path to the presidency, listen to me, this is a long process. Okay? In fact, I'm telling you, right now, there are Democratic leaders, right? And when I say Democratic leaders, I mean leaders of the Democratic Party who are meeting in secret rooms and they are already beginning to discuss who do we run in 2020? Okay? Because they plan things like that that far in advance. That's why Michael Moore was an infamous liberal, right? And infamous really is the correct word to describe him. 
okay, has already come out. He came out before Trump even became president. He came out before Trump was even elected president of the United States, said Trump was going to win, and Democrats are wrong for how they do things, and they need to run Tom Hanks. That's Michael Moore's plan. Tom Hanks, 2020. Right? And Tom Hanks, the actor. Forrest Gump, that's Tom Hanks. That man. No, 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 we're talking about that man. We're talking about Forrest Gump. Right? We want Forrest Gump to be the next president of the United States. Hey, and intellectually, that might be a step up. Okay? But listen. Guys, so listen, understand that this process is a long and drawn out process because you have what we consider what we call an invisible primary. This is people that are already floating ideas and, and putting together focus groups and, and conducting polls internally to determine do I have a shot at being the next candidate for president of the United States. Okay? And Three or four years ago, 18 different Republicans apparently came up with the answer of yes. Yes, I do have a shot. All right? Then what happens is you actually begin the nomination phase. And the nomination phase is obviously the first step prior to even becoming president of the United States because you have to get a nomination. Right? So you have to go out and you have to caucus. You have to go talk to people. You have to go sort of door to door. The, the term you will hear if you pay attention to the nomination process, if you pay attention to presidential politics in terms of getting elected, is they talk about ground game. Right? Ted Cruz ran around and was like, we're going to beat Donald Trump because he doesn't know what ground game is. Okay? There are actually people that think that Clinton lost because her ground game was weak in states like Michigan. Because she didn't have people going door to door being like, hey, this is a really important election. You need to come out and vote. Instead, the Clinton campaign left Michigan alone and went, hey, Michigan's Democrat, man. They always vote for the Democrat. We're good. Okay? A gross miscalculation on her part. Okay? Now, the Iowa caucus becomes one of the most prominent or important in this regard because Iowa is first. Okay? And understand that there's a difference between caucuses and primaries. Okay? A caucus is more like a convention. Okay? In a caucus, a bunch of people get together, and you cast a vote, and you come up with a consensus. And you might have to vote four or five or six times. Okay? And then from that little local caucus, you move forward, and you go up to the next level. Right? And we, so here's the thing. Like, let's just say for the sake of argument that we're trying to elect the next student body president here at George Ranch, right? So we might have Coach Baker's class caucus, okay? And so all of my students would get together, and they would talk about who Coach Baker's class wants to be the next student body president, okay? And we would come up with our candidate. That might be different than Miss Bodie's social studies class, or Coach Janicek's government class, or Coach Spradlin's government class, okay? And then ultimately, all the social studies classes would come together, and we'd have the social studies caucus, and then, <clears throat> excuse me, at that point we would have a school-wide caucus that would actually cast the vote, right? But it's a multi-tiered process. The primaries are different. Primaries are what you think of in terms of voting. You go, you cast your vote one time, plurality wins, right? So if you actually go back and you look, right, at some of these primaries because the Republicans ran 18 people, guess what? Donald Trump got 25% of the vote. One out of four people actually liked Donald Trump. Donald Trump won. Because 18 people ran. 18 people got votes. Okay? So primaries have actually become far more frequent and common in the American political process lately because it becomes a lot easier. It's a lot simpler. Caucusing takes all day. Right? And caucuses generally have a lower turnout than uh, primaries because people don't understand what they're doing as much. All right? Then, once your state has done its primary, you select delegates to, a con to attend the convention. Right? And those delegates at the convention, they cast their vote for their candidate. I I'll be 100%.
honest with you, apparently I don't understand how that process works. Because if you would watch the Republican convention this year, Alaska voted for Ted Cruz. Alaska is obviously high up in the, in the alphabet, right? So when re the Republicans went through state by state and did a roll call vote and asked, who do you vote for? And Alaska was like, 11 votes, Ted Cruz. And then the chairman went, 11 votes, Donald Trump. Okay? How that happened is beyond me. I don't understand it. All right? But there are very, very, very specific rules in conventions and how all that happens. Now, the New Hampshire primary is the most important primary. It is the second. So the Iowa caucus is first, New Hampshire primary is second. Candidates in the primary process spend a lot of time dealing with those states because if you don't do well in those two states, you're pretty much dead in the water at that point. It's hard to come back. Okay? You then look for Super Tuesday, which is where like a whole bunch of southern states and a couple of others all have their candidate or their their uh, primaries at the same time. Right? Now, once all of the states have voted in their primaries, you go to the national convention. This generally happens roughly in July, right? Here you get a bunch of speeches, okay? You come up with your actual nominee, he selects his VP, okay? One of the key aspects of the convention, and it's not really related to the path to the presidency, but it's down here near the bottom, is develop the party platform. Okay? And we'll talk about platforms and planks a little bit later. Right? I'm going to let you go through all the political cartoons on your own time. All right, now, obviously there's some positives and negatives to the manner in which we do things. And okay? the primary process should afford or supposed to allow more participation by the people. I will tell you right now, both the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, because this is party based and they get to make up their own rules themselves, because ultimately it's their candidate that you're picking, right? You're not picking a president. You're picking a Republican or a Democrat. That means the political party has significant control over how it does things. Hence, the Democratic Party held debates on like a Saturday night. How many of you are going to watch a debate on a Saturday night? Nobody. Right? They intentionally hid debates at various times on television that most people wouldn't watch them. Why? Because they didn't want people to know about Bernie Sanders. Right? The Democrats rigged their own primary process to ensure that Hillary Clinton would be their candidate. And Republicans actually changed their primary process after 2012, ironically enough, to try to ensure that somebody like Donald Trump couldn't become the next president or the next nominee. Right? And it would have worked, too, if it weren't for the fact that 18 people were running. Because at what point in time, in any of the primaries, did Donald Trump get more than, like, 25% of the vote? It didn't happen. It didn't happen until you got down to three candidates and it became apparent and obvious that Trump was the next nominee anyway. Okay? Because that is one of the real negatives to this process is that it is long and drawn out and it takes months. And if you live in California, right, because the first primaries are in like February. If you live in California, your primary is not until July or late June. I don't remember which. Okay? But literally, by the time California voted in the primaries, most populated state in the United States of America, right, 40 million people, they didn't have a choice. Not one. By the time the primaries got there, both Clinton and Trump had wrapped it up. They had enough delegates at that point to go ahead and win. So now California doesn't even get a voice at all, right, which is a little absurd. Okay. We do, uh, well, this is what I'm talking about, the front loading of primaries, right? That's the negative effect there for somebody like California, all right? That makes it difficult or uh, problematic. I will tell you another real problem with the primary process, and this you see specifically with Republicans. In order to get the nomination, you have to go right of right. You know what I mean when I say that? 
in order, if 18 Republicans win, the only way you can actually win the nomination is if you are the furthest to the right. You are the most uber, super Republican out there. Okay? And then what happens when you go into a general election? Now all of a sudden they're like, wait, whoa, whoa, whoa. Just three months ago you said that the KKK is great. Right? Because you gotta, you got to support like all white people. Because that's what the Republican Party does. And now all of a sudden you're going to be like, no, I love all people. That's not what you said earlier. Like, you hate immigrants. All right? It becomes very difficult. And look, you see the same thing on the Democratic side, just not quite as much. They, they don't, they're not cannibals like the Republicans are. They don't eat each other up. I mean, yeah, Sanders tried to push Clinton further left, but he didn't really, he wasn't successful in it. All right? Okay, so there we go. Um, then once you campaign, we have election days. We know that the election in November is not the real election, right? In December, the electors, the actual electoral college, they get together. They cast their ballots. It then goes to the House of Representatives. They certify the ballot. And then we have inauguration day on the 20th of January. All right, um, so that's the process. Go ahead and pack it up. I didn't give you any extra time. I apologize.